Well, how are you doing? It's March 26, 2019. Big events in the lives of little men. <laughs> how are you doing, Sam? Not too bad. All right. How's things going in Joplin there? Pretty busy. Pretty busy. Spring is in the air. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is here, too. Yeah. Finally, our snow's out. done gone. Yeah, it's about time. Yeah. Yeah, well, what we'll do today is we'll finish the uh, the unit on today's real ear and just recapping a few things that we touched on last week. Just making sure we've kind of got our ducks in a row regarding RETSPULS, R-E-C-D, R-E-D-D, all these lovely little acronyms. How did we get from D-B-H-L to D-B-S-P-L on the audiogram, no? All right, we will share screen here. And looking at our uh, PowerPoint where we ended last week. We covered last week, we looked at a few gain versus output slides. And we went through a few examples. And I encouraged people to kind of do this on their own as well. To really make sure that you could go from moving from gain to output. And it's not so bad, you know, if you draw the lines, you're able to see that 30 dB gain with a 40 decibel input. Okay, it's basically going to give you 30 dB input or 40 input plus 30 dB gain is going to give you a 70 decibel output and that kind of stuff. And when we showed various audiograms, or I should say when we're looking at stuff like this, moving from gain to output, when you're looking at gain, the softest input receives the greatest gain. When you're looking at output, the softest input gives you the bottom output. So it's exactly back ass words in reading this language from reading this one. Okay, so for a 40 decibel input, 30 dB of gain, whoa, was going to give you a 70 dB gain output here. And you can see that. Looking at a 60 dB input, 20 dB of gain is going to be giving you an 80 decibel output. And similarly, 80 dB input, giving only 10 decibels a gain is going to give you a 90 dB output. And when you're looking at stuff like this, where things are similar in the lows, then the differences even get wilder. I mean, this is exactly the same as the red. They are identical. It's just that this one's in German and this one's spoken in Polish. So for these three inputs here, they're all being given 10 dB of gain at this frequency. So a 40 decibel input is going to give me an output of 50, because 40 and 10 is 50. And a 60 dB input, and I'm getting 10 dB of, of gain over there at that frequency, my output is going to be 70. And similarly, an 80 decibel input, I'm getting 10 dB of gain at the lowest frequency, 80 and, and 10 is 90. So these are the things, this is how we finished last week. Looking at these four slides. So now when we move to today's real ear, let's continue on from here. Probe tube measures and fitting methods. Mainly we're using NAL1 or NAL2 or DSL5. And NAL1 is beginning to fade. Most people are using NAL2 or DSL5. NAL2 is just a, some readjustments or tweakings done to NAL1. Because some people thought that NAL1 was giving a little bit too much gain, a little bit too much output. So NAL2 was twisted up a bit. Manufacturers also have their proprietary fitting methods. And these always tend to roll off the highs. And why? And software almost over, always paints a prettier picture than what you're going to get. It almost always overestimates the gain or output. It looks through rose-colored glasses. Really, or almost always shows less than what was predicted in the software. And we're going to look at this from a different point of view next week. But for this week, let's just stick to Snickers here. Today's real ear measurement, we visualize aided speech, also known as speech mapping. And with DSL, there they are the ones who really brought today's real ear into being. It was DSL that did it. They were the ones that insisted on moving from HL to SPL, showing hearing loss in SPL, showing the targets in SPL, 
showing the loudness discomfort levels in SPL, everything. And so that the everything hearing loss and hearing aids then are being read in the same language. They're speaking the same language, namely DBSPL. DSL said garbage in is garbage out. If you build your house on sand, it's going to fall when the winds come. Okay, so they have lots of transforms, real ear to coupler difference, mic location effect, and all these things are added to the hearing loss in order to transfer it from DBHL to DBSPL. The audiogram is always displayed then right side up. In situ, in situation, really your aided response becomes the main focus. Everything's in terms of SPL. And aided speech is then placed onto one's dynamic range. Thresholds in DBHL are changed into thresholds in DBSPL. The audiometer is calibrated to the average ear. Average adult real ear to coupler difference is used to change thresholds. Measured rec real ear to coupler different is recommended for odd ear canals. So we'll talk. I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more. So stick with it here a second. Okay. Looking at RECD. Just kind of look at where we're going here. Da, 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 da. Okay. First, let's look at what RECD is. Make sure we know that. Here's a response of a hearing aid in a 2cc coupler, the dashed line. If you added 5 dB below 1,000 hertz and you add about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz, that will give you the average real ear to coupler difference. Average RECD is about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz, 10 dB below, or 5 dB below 1,000 hertz. So when you see what a hearing aid is doing in a 2cc coupler, always remember it's underestimating what takes place in the ear canal because the closed ear canal is smaller than 2cc's. It's between one to one and a half. And as we move here, real ear to coupler difference. This is a lot of verbiage, so I really wouldn't worry too much about it, but basically it's the difference between SPL measured in a real ear with insert headphones as opposed to DBSPL with an insert headphone in a 2cc coupler. It's the difference. Remember, insert headphones are calibrated on a 2cc coupler. Okay, so our hearing aids measured on a 2cc coupler. So RECD is basically the difference between what an insert headphone is doing in a 2cc coupler versus or what a hearing aid is doing on a 2cc coupler as opposed to what the insert headphone is delivering in your ear canal when it's stuck in there because that space is smaller than 2cc's or when a hearing aid is stuck in your ear because that's smaller than 2cc's. But always remember, 2cc coupler is used to calibrate insert headphones. It's also, of course, used to measure what hearing aids are doing. But remember, it basically, 2cc couplers underestimate, not overestimate, underestimate what a hearing aid is going to do in a real ear because when a hearing aid is closed in a real ear, that space is smaller than 2cc's. The way people measure RECDs, check it out. So real ear to coupler difference represents how real ear canal is not the same as a 2cc coupler. A 2cc coupler contains 2cc volume of air. It was adopted in 1959. Gives a rough approximation to the ear canal, but not really 100% accurate. The typical ear canal has less than 2cc volume. They are generally about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz, the differences are, and the differences are about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz. And now remember, that's average R-E-C-D. And Gus Mueller and many other people suggest, you know what? Use average R-E-C-D when you're typically fitting the average adult. You don't need to measure the RECD. You only measure the RECD if the person has a weird looking ear canal. Okay? If the person's got an abnormally large honking ear canal or some wee little piddly ear canal, then you will not have the average RECD, of course. 
then you will be varying from that, and it probably behooves of you to measure it. But before we go any further about measuring it and all that, let's look at some context here. Let's be sure to look at context, and to do that, let's look at our notes. When we go to the notes, and I'll get out of here, and look at the notes here. Let's look at these transforms. Let's just see where RECD fits among everything. So here we go. How do we get from DBHL on an audiogram to DBSPL on an SPLogram or speech mapping? Two transforms are needed. Retspuls and Recta. <laughs> R-E-T-S-P-L, R-E-T-S-P-L, suck it to me, suck it to me, real ear reference equivalent threshold, sound pressure level, and real ear decoupler difference. Now, what are they? Make sure we know them, okay? Reference equivalent sound pressure level and R-E-C-D. Both of those added together get you to minimal audible pressure. Okay, both of them give you, you that's how you're transferring, because you're adding minimal audible pressure to the thresholds. Let's make sure we know that. Let's look at our, at our PowerPoint here and make sure we don't go weird on anybody. So here you go. I will pull up this picture. Here's your thresholds in DBHL. Here's the same thresholds plotted in DBSPL. How did we get from here to here? You added this to this. So this plus this equals this. So if you're looking at this threshold being 20, and you're looking at 20 dB required to just barely hear, okay? Add them together, you're at 40. See what I mean? Okay, so there you go. But how do we get to this? How does the typical audiogram trans, how do we get this value here? Sure, we measured everything under a headphone and blah, 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 blah. But how does the computer do it? Okay, we know what minimal audible pressure is. It's the softest it takes for someone to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Sure, but how does the computer do that? You're taking those values. Let's look at it. We should actually look more at our notes for this. So I'm going to go to our notes. Okay, so having escaped out of there, looking at our notes. Reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level. It's the difference between an audiometer dial reading setting and the output from the headphone measured in a 2cc coupler. And it's got to be an insert headphone because inserts are calibrated on a 2cc coupler. So if your dial is set at 1,000 hertz and it's set at 70 dB SPL, what's the output from the headphone in the 2cc coupler? Call that X, whatever it is. If the, if the dial says 70 at 1,000 hertz, it's not going to be 70 at 1,000 hertz in the 2cc coupler. It's going to be different, okay? So the dip, because the dial reading is in dBHL, and what's being measured in the 2cc coupler is dBSPL. So insert headphones are measured in a 2cc coupler. By the way, circumoral headphones are measured in a 6cc coupler. And people don't have 6cc couplers lying around, okay? Nobody uses 6cc couplers except people coming around to calibrate your audiometers. And if you're using circumoral headphones, they're going to put your circumoral headphone on a, two, on a 6cc coupler. 6cc couplers are big. They're about, gosh darn, about like that, okay? They're great big... And that's set on top of a microphone. So here's your microphone. Here's the 6cc coupler. And then the headphone is put on top of that. So when your dial reading is 70 and you're at 1,000 hertz, what's coming at the mic underneath that 6cc coupler? And why 6cc's? Because that's the volume of air trapped under a circumoral headphone. 
on average. Okay, whether it really is that, who knows? Look at how much variation you can get with that from one person to another person, from Angela to Sam to Ted. How much volume of air is going to be trapped underneath the circumoral headphones? You're going to have quite a variety. With inserts, you're going to have less variety because you're talking a smaller space to begin with, right? Okay, so there's a huge advantage for using insert headphones. But back to our notes. People don't have 6cc couplers hanging around, so we don't even talk about that. Rather, real ear wishes that you used insert headphones. Because then all you need to do, look at this. Retspul is the difference between the audiometer dial setting, say 1000 hertz at 70 dBHL, and what's the SPL at 1000 hertz coming out of the, two, out of the headphone into the 2cc coupler? Retspul is an audiometer thing. It brings you from the audiometer to the 2cc coupler, but not all the way to the ear. For that, you need real ear to coupler difference. And that's the difference between SPL and a closed 2cc coupler and a closed ear canal. Okay, so Retspul plus real ear to coupler difference equals real ear to dial difference. And real ear to dial difference is MAP. So, because different couplers for inserts versus circumoral headphones, you'll get slightly different REDDs, but no one has 6cc couplers lying around. Only those who calibrate audiometers do. Okay? So, let's dispense with circumoral headphones, RETSPULs, and RECDs. If you're using circumoral headphones, then basically your average difference, what you need to basically think about, if I do this, if you're using circumoral headphones, you are literally adding minimal audible pressure and getting this. Okay? So circumoral headphones have their own red spell. And then you've got, you know, your, 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 your it, the circumoral headphones, real ear to dial difference. And that's minimal audible pressure. And if you're using insert headphones, average RECD gets you there. Normally, if you were using circumoral headphones, you'd be using the Retspul real, no, reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level, getting you from the dial reading. Let's all just put this in English. If you were using circumoral headphones, you'd be using the re reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level of the dial reading, 1000 hertz at 70 dBHL. And then what's the output of the circumoral, of the circumoral headphone on a great big CC? 6cc coupler, and what's the SPL coming out there? Okay? People don't have, and that, that's, that's the Retspul you'd use. And then you'd have to use, and then how are you going to get from there? What's, how do you get from a 6cc coupler to a human ear? You can't, because we don't have 6cc couplers lying around. Okay? So you can't. So the only thing you can think of if you've used circumoral headphones, just simply adopt minimal audible pressure and add that in. And that's what the machines automatically do. You know what some fanatics do? Man, this is just a joke. This is hilarious. Well, I'll just talk to you here. What they actually do, in if, the, if somebody has a really weird ear canal, a small ear canal or an overly large ear canal, they will measure this. They'll actually stick a tube in the ear canal up to the drum and then put the headphone carefully on top of that and then measure put zero put 70 dbhl dial reading on your audiometer a thousand hertz at 70 and then with the probe tube measured in the ear canal the probe tube is up to your eardrum they'll measure the actual spl at your eardrum at that frequency and they'll mark that down. Then they'll turn the dial reading, say, to 2,000 hertz at 70. And they'll read the, what's the average, or what's, what's actually coming out at the earphone? Write that down. Then they'll turn it to 4,000 hertz at 70. And what's actually coming out of the eardrum and being picked up by the probe tube at 4,000 hertz in the ear canal? And then 8,000 hertz. And then they'll do 250 and 500. 
and they'll come up with the measured R E D D. Whoa. Most almost nobody I know does that. Nobody. What people tend to do is use average R E D D, which is minimal audible pressure. Screw it. They're done with it. Okay? But Circumoral headphones are falling out of favor. Fewer people are using them. So what we use mostly today is inserts. And the, all you need to get from the audiometer dial reading to the real ear, the Retspool is built in, of course, just like it was for circumoral headphones. Remember, R-E-T-S-P-L gets you from the audiometer to the 2CC coupler. Okay, that's built in for inserts, that's built in for circumoral headphones. But to move from the next step, from the coupler to the real ear, you can only do that with the 2cc coupler because how do you measure what's taking place from a 6cc coupler to the human ear? Nobody has 6cc couplers lying around. So if you've used circumoral headphones, you simply choose average REDD, which is minimal audible pressure and add it to the headphones. And if you're using inserts, you're going to use the RETSPL reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level taking you from the dial reading to the output of an insert headphone in a 2cc coupler. And then you're going to use average RECD to get you from the 2cc coupler to the human ear. And if the person's ear canal is weird, you'll measure the RECD. And usually it isn't, so you'll choose the average. Done. And that also gets you pretty close to minimal audible pressure, but with an insert headphone. So MAP is MAP is MAP. Did you get there with circumoral headphones or did you get there with insert headphones? This has been a weird talk, but basically what I want you to grasp out of it is this. RETSPL gets you from the audiometer to the 2CC coupler. Real ear to coupler difference gets you from the 2CC coupler to the real ear. And you measure RECD if the ear canal is downright strange. Otherwise, not. You know why? Because any tweaking you're going to do with the hearing aid to accommodate someone's particular desires already changes things. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so you can get too picky. And if you're talking about 1 or 2 dB, who cares? That's not it. You've got to paint with broader strokes. So people tend to choose average RECDs when you're doing real ear. Share screen. Okay, move on down to here. If you were measuring RECD, it's really, it's not that hard to do. I'll just show you how. We'll just have some, we have some PowerPoint slides that show you how it's done. Look at that. So average good old Whoops, whoa, I was, went way to the end there. <laughs> Don't get a seizure. Hang on. You're almost here. There you go. Okay. Here's a hearing aid stuck on a 2cc coupler. An ITE, two cubic centimeters of air, measurement microphone. A BTE on a 2cc coupler, two cubic centimeters of air, the measurement microphone. How is it done to change DBHL value with inserts into SPL values? Applies to insert headphones. And average ones will give you the, the good old thresholds, okay, because you're taking the RETSPL of, two C, of, of insert headphones and the average RECD, and that's going to give you the minimal audible pressure with insert headphones. Fine. You've gone all the way from the audiometer to the real ear. Fine. Okay. Inserts normally are calibrated in a 2cc coupler. RECD simply adjusts these insert calibration values because the insert is now in the ear canal. Let's look at that. They're talking about measuring these things. So here goes. How to do it if you were to measure it. Here's the out. Uh, here's a, 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 a. So this is coming from the real ear. This is the transducer. Okay. This you can plug this into the real ear system. And you put that into the 2cc coupler for a BTE. And there's the measurement mic. Now put the probe tube in the ear canal and connect the same transducer to an insert headphone tip. 
and put that in the ear canal. Be careful not to move the tube. Play the signal again. RECD equals what was measured in the ear minus the 2CC coupler response. Remember, the ear always produces more because it's a smaller space. So here's what it looks like. First, you did this, and you got the measurement in a 2cc coupler. Then you did this. Here's the probe tube stuck in the ear. Now you've taken that same transducer from your real ear equipment, the same thing here, and only you've just plugged it into an insert headphone, and you stuck that in the ear. So how do you measure RECD? First this, and then this. So this, what you're getting here, minus what you're getting here, is going to give you your real ear to coupler difference. So here's the average RECD. See how it's about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz? About 10 dB above 1,000 hertz. Okay? So measuring the real ear response of the insert headphone, there's a third picture of it. So here, if you actually measured someone's RECD. If you actually measured it, it might be a little bit different from average. Look at that. Then in this case, it's the yellow. Okay, so you may not get the actual RECD. You might get a little bit different. The coupler response, the real ear response, and this is average real ear to diff coupler difference, the dotted line, and this is the person's real ear to coupler difference. So in this case, the difference between the red and the white lines is the yellow. But in the average, the average difference is going to be here, the dotted, the dashed. Average RECD, the person's RECD. Another great reason for measuring RECD is when fitting children, but we don't do that. But you've got some squawking, screaming kid. If you can just get his RECD, you can send him home. Because then you can put the hearing aid on a 2cc coupler, bink in the kid's thresholds, choose your fitting method, and then factor in RECD, and you'll know exactly what it's going to do in the kid's ear. Not bad, huh? Because kids have a smaller ear canal. So it's more important to measure their RECD, because their RECD isn't going to be the average 5 and 10 dB, like an adult. And they called that SREM, Simulated Real Ear Measurement mainly done with children. So here is, uh, before, I, before I go anywhere else, let's just talk turkey for a second. RECD, what is it going to do? What's, why measure it? Because RECD is used to change SPHL into SPL. You've got the reference equivalent sound pressure level of the insert headphone, plus the average RECD will get you to the SPLogram. But if you've measured an RECD and it's a little bit different from the average RECD, what effect is that going to have? It's going to change the thresholds. Remember, your thresholds in DBS SPL arise from reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level plus real ear to coupler difference. And that gives you the thresholds as that's what you're going to get on your, on your SPLogram, on your speech map. So if your measured RECD is a little bit different from your average, it's going to change your thresholds a little bit. And if it changes your thresholds in DBSPL, what else is it going to change? It's going to change your targets. No matter what fitting method you chose, changed thresholds are going to result in changed targets. So, RECD, if it's different from average, it's going to change the thresholds, which in turn will change the targets. Never say it changes the targets first. It changes thresholds, which in turn changes targets. Okay? And to summarize all the blither blather I've talked about today, Moving from circumoral headphones to the speech map, Retspull for circumoral headphones, plus the RECD for circumoral headphones, which we can't measure because we don't have a 6cc coupler hanging around, would give you MAP. 
insert headphones. Retzpol, reference equivalent threshold SPL for inserts, will take you from the audiogram, audiometer to the 2CC coupler, and RECD will take you the rest of the way to the ear. And you can measure the RECD. Easy peasy Japanesey because everybody's got the 2CC coupler hanging around. But not many people do measure RECD. Usually people choose average. And if you use circumoral headphones, people choose real ear to dial difference, which is MAP. Done. Okay? End of that story. Share screen. I think we've just gone through the worst thicket of today's real ear. Yikes. Okay. Here's old, early, actually this, this is new real ear, but the first version of it. Look at this guy's, look at normal here, MAP on the bottom. Here's someone's thresholds, a fairly flat loss, I guess. Here's the DSL-4 targets. You know they're DSL-4 targets because they're halfway inside the, the dynamic range. And then here was the output for average speech inputs, looking pretty good, but still old DSL-4, so it's too much. And then you see these weird lines, and you can kind of see where they intersect. This one here ends about here, and this bottom line kind of ends about here. You can see where this, they sort of double up a bit. And these bottom lines were soft speech-like stimuli, about 55. And you'd want them to be hanging around about halfway around the thresholds. And then loud input speech. And you'd want the tops of the bars never to exceed UCL. Here, of course, they did. But here's another loss. A fairly flat loss, or it's the same one. Here's the hearing loss. Again, you're looking at the fitting. This one here got reduced a little bit. We cut that one down a little bit, but that was early today's real ear. We've moved on, okay? Basically, average inputs are 65 dB SPL. Soft inputs are 55 dB SPL. Loud inputs, generally 80-ish dB SPL. Here's normal hearing, of course, minimal audible pressure. Here's the person's thresholds now in dBSPL. Here's some targets. Might be now, could be whatever. Let's see what target it is. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I don't see any. Uh, oh, yeah, now one. It's now one targets. Here's loudness discomfort for the very frequency. So it must be frequency specific loudness discomfort levels. And you'd watch your output for average speech inputs to hug these thresholds. Again, here's your unaided long-term average speech spectrum. You can see which parts are audible and which parts aren't. Of course, you'd want to lift this up here so it's sitting nicely in the person's dynamic range. And look at ELT's long-term average speech spectrum, and we'll quickly review here the fact that it's about 30 dB thick. Okay, about 30 dB thick. And the mean average is not in the center of the, of the range. It's 12 dB below the top and 18 dB above the bottom. How come it ain't right in the middle? Here's why. Average noise like a fan or air conditioner. Stays pretty steady in intensity over time. Speech fluctuates widely. The peak to, to peak contrast in speech is about 30 dB. That's why this, remember, this is a spectrum. This is a waveform. Time, amplitude. Okay, frequency, amplitude. All right, so the decibel distance between the softest to the loudest of average ongoing speech waveform is about 30 dB. That's why LTAS, long-term average speech spectrum, is about, is about 30 dB wide. And why does the mean not sit in the center of the range? It's because speech fluctuates rapidly over time, unlike a fan or air conditioner. 
So when you think about distributions of intensity, a fan or an air conditioner, or even background hubbub, blah, 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 babble at a party, blah, 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 once in a while, blah, 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 okay? On average, most noise is going to be at some particular fixed intensity. It may vary a little bit, so it's of less sometimes. It may vary a little bit in that it's more at other times, but basically, basically, it's going to have a normal bell-shaped distribution, just like in a classroom. How many kids got A's? How many got B's? How many got C's? And how many got D's? Okay, this axis represents the score or the intensity level, and this, ac ac whoa, this axis here represents the percent of time that the noise or the grades were what they were. So the, the teacher in the classroom, most kids, I guess, got Bs and Cs. A few kids got As, a few kids got Ds. See? And when we're talking noise, a fan or an air conditioner, most of the time, it's at this particular intensity. Less of a time it's at this intensity, less of a time it's at this intensity, okay? But speech, this weird signal here, because it's changing so rapidly over time, has a very abnormal distribution of intensity. And that's why if anyone did statistics, and I don't, but this is what they tell you, that's why the average of speech is not in the center of its range. At any rate, what part of this do you want to match the targets? And the part that you want to match the targets is the mean, this average. This line here is what you want to match these asterisks or these plus signs, okay? Again, long-term average speech spectrum, the mean isn't exactly in the center of the range. Why is this greater here? Because that's the vowels, this is the consonants. So what speech sounds are audible here and which ones aren't? Now, you know the ones that aren't are the ones over here. The ones that are are over here. They are literally above the thresholds. So let's compare the fitting methods again just for fun on a sloping audiogram. DSL-5 for adults. Here's its targets for this particular loss. And no, look at how these targets are barely above thresholds. And what's this the target for? Average inputs. You think, now why is that so low? Well, if the mean average, if this is, if this, okay, right where my cursor is, if this is placed here, then there's still quite a bit up here, isn't there? Okay, that's how you should see it. So DSL-5 for an adult, now one for an adult. Know how, notice how now one asks for a little bit more in the mids than DSL, but a little bit less in the highs. And now two versus now one. Now two versus one. And, this is, and what's this green? Unaided. Okay, just unaided speech. Person wasn't wearing hearing aids, we're just looking at the targets. Okay, that's what this green here. But what would you want? You'd want this mean average, this line, to be here. Isn't that weird how the, the mean average here is even below the threshold? Well, I guess there's still a bit above here. Odd, isn't it? But it's, that's the fitting method. Now two, now one. See how now two doesn't ask for quite as much in the mids, but it asks for a little bit more little bit more in the highs. I can kind of see it here. Looking at 65 and 55, both. DSL for an adult, okay, 65 would be green, 55 would be the pink. Again, this is unaided, so don't worry about it. See how this, this average is for 65 inputs? And this is what you, what you want your outputs to be for soft inputs. So here's what you want your outputs to be for soft inputs. Here's what you want your outputs to be for average inputs. Now two, whoa, 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 whoa. DSL five, now two. And I only am looking at DSL five and now two, not at now one right now, because now two is more you often use than now one. 
now two is today's version of now one. So why use now one? Okay. But the differences between DSL-5 for average and soft inputs, not a lot of difference, is there? Not really, you know? When you, especially when you factor in tweaking things to accommodate a particular client's desires, then those differences are automatically going to be, you know? Look at this. Is this a good fit for an average speech input of 65 dB SPL? Why or why not? And ask yourselves the question here. How come? What would this be? What do you think? The purple, okay? The pink. Unaided speech, long-term average speech spectrum, unaided, aided. Is there anything wrong with this? Is it for an average speech input, there is. It's too much. This is sitting halfway in the listener's dynamic range. Look where the targets are for NAL2, for average, the green, and DSL-5 for the green. So you can see how this is way too much for an average speech input of 65. Do your comparison, okay? The green is for 65, and for DSL-5, the green is for 65 dB SPL inputs. For what speech input might this be a good fit? And as you're looking at it, notice how the output is hugging the thresholds, okay? It is a good fit for soft speech inputs because it means soft speech is barely audible. It's just above the thresholds. Well, how does that compare here? Yep, quite similar. And here, yep, quite similar. For what speech input, input might this be a good fit? The purple. And when you're looking at that, it's about a third above the thresholds, a bit above but it's all above the thresholds, which is good. So this might be a good fit for average speech inputs. Notice that the output, it's not halfway in the listener's dynamic range. It's less than halfway. It's about a third, a, a quarter to a third. That's essentially what we're doing today. Does this look like a complete fitting? Why or why not? Does to me, with the exception of this problem right here, other than that, you've done it all. Okay, here's your outputs for soft speech inputs. Here's your outputs for average speech inputs. Here's your output for loud out inputs. And with this one exception here, you're obeying the rules there too because you've stayed <clears throat> below the uh, loudness discomfort levels. And re I repeat, these are frequency specific loudness discomfort levels, but still, you've mapped speech. For soft, average, and loud inputs, you've mapped it. It's all within the listener's dynamic range. Can you interpret this as a different real ear system? This is the Oracle, Odo Suite, a different system. When you're looking here, you're looking in, you've got minimal audible pressure here. You've got loudness discomfort way up here. You've got average speech. This is where you'd want it to be. This is a bit much. Okay, but this is where you this is for this is where an average person with normal hearing would want speech to be. When you're looking at the hearing loss, it's a flat hearing loss. It's got to be because this line here is minimal audible pressure and on the audiogram it's 0 dBHL. So these thresholds here, what would they be? If this is 75 at 250, and this is 25 at 250, the difference between 75 and 25 is 50. So all we've done is banked in a flat 50 dB hearing loss. So this person's thresholds look just like MAP, they're just lifted up by 50 dB. And now you've measured what the hearing aid's doing. Is this a good fitting? A little much. On the Oracle system, it's saying you'd want your outputs for average inputs to be sitting here. And these are a little bit excessive. What's going on here? Can the person hear? None of it. It's all below threshold. For what speech input might this be a good fit? Again, average, or I should say soft speech inputs, because the mean is hugging the thresholds. 
so it means it's barely audible. For what speech input might this be a good fit? Average speech inputs, although even this is a bit much. It's kind of more than a third. It's kind of approaching a bit of a half, isn't it? It might be a little bit of an overfit, I think. So today it's DSL-5 or NAL-2 with these inputs, 65, 55, and this is a bit excessive. You should say if it's speech especially. This is an MPO stimulus coming out of the audio scan being do 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 and that you can leave at 85, but if it's speech, it's probably 75 to 80. Average, 65. Soft, 55. Loud speech, 75 to 80. If it's an MPO stimulus of do 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 then 85, because those are frequency specific. Speech is a broadband stimulus. And what's this? A bouquet of these, okay? So here's what I kind of wrote some time ago in 2012. Fitting methods are becoming like islands in the setting sun because of today's real ear settings. We can see what the person hears. Liebarger would have given his eye teeth to have our real ear with speech mapping. Because really, I mean, and I, I tried to be biblical here, but they're converging to where we, they began. The author contends that a brief history of hearing aid fitting methods show that they are converging back to where they began. In the beginning was functional gain. Real ear measures did not exist. All hearing aids were linear, and darkness moved upon the face of the deep. Okay, in the beginning, all right, you had functional gain. You couldn't see what the person heard. You aided halfway because you knew if you improved someone's thresholds by half, that's thresholds for hearing soft sounds, but speech is 65. So I can't amplify by the full degree of the loss. So if the input is 65 dBA SPL or 55 dBHL, I've got to use half. I've got to improve the thresholds by half. If I do that, then I'm adding half gain to an average speech input, and my outputs will be nice. As was shown in your PowerPoint, way back. So now we'll just kind of finish today's talk by looking at that. Just go way up. Okay, here you go. The idea behind functional gain, if you aided the thresholds by half, it meant that aided speech output would sit nicely in the dynamic range of the listener. But you couldn't see this. You could only Believe this. And blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. Okay? That's all they could do. You didn't have real ear. Then came early real ear. And people talked all about gain as well, just like they did here. If you improve the thresholds by half, your aided speech outputs should sit in the listener's dynamic range. Then we got real ear, and we stuck a tube in the person's ear canal, and we measured the real ear unaided response, held the tube in place, put a hearing aid on top, measured real ear aided response. The difference between these two was real ear insertion gain. Did that match your target? Now this red line, remember, is exactly the same as the letter A's here. This could be the burger half gain, it could, or it could be the half gain, it could be burger, it could be pogo, could be Libby, could be now, doesn't matter. The point is the fitting methods didn't change. The target values are the same. It's just that now you're looking at insertion gain instead of functional gain. Functional gain is behavioral, doing the thresholds once under headphones and once with a hearing aid in a sound field. Here you're looking at insertion gain. Your target hasn't changed, but your method of measurement is now non-behavioral. And so you're looking at the difference between here and here, but a lousy counseling tool this is. Because how do you know what parts of speech are audible, and how do you know what parts of speech are inaudible? All you're trying to do is make the black line match the red line. 
nice video game, but I don't know what it really tells. So in a way, this was no real improvement. The best thing about this was that it was quicker than doing this. Okay? But other than that, it didn't talk too much. Besides, you're using really your unaided response when you didn't use it in a hearing test because you had the ear plugged. And remember, real ear unaided is the open unaided ear canal resonance. So we went to today's real ear, where thresholds are changed into thresholds in DBSPL. So now hearing aids and hearing loss are reading the same language. And we're adding minimal audible pressure to hear to get to these thresholds. And the detail of it is, Retzpel reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level for circumoral headphones plus real ear to coupler difference for circumoral headphones will give you this. Or with inserts, Retzpel reference equivalent sound pressure level for inserts plus real ear to coupler difference for inserts, which you can easily measure if you wanted to, or take the average, gives you this, gives you minimal audible pressure. Okay, so you're getting to this. This black line here, this black dotted line, is a result from, in the computer, from RETSPL plus RECD, whether it's with a circumoral headphone or insert headphones. Okay, but we don't have 6CC couplers hanging around, so if you've used insert headphones, all you need to do is choose average RECD and you're good to go because the RETSPL is built into the real ear system, so is the RETSPL built into the real ear system for circumoral headphones. The only missing link is the 6CC coupler for circumoral headphones, so forget about it. Just use this. And since people choose the average, it's done. You're not doing anything. And same with when you're using insert headphones. If you've chosen in average RECDs, you're not doing anything. You don't need to. The machine does it for you, okay? So changing from HL to SPL is done automatically for you. You've gone, the RETSPLs are done, and the real ear to coupler differences are done. They're both done if you've chosen average, okay? So with circumoral headphones, you're going to choose average real ear to dial difference. Yep, okay. Sir, insert headphones. You're going to choose RECD average. Yep, usually. Okay, don't do anything. This is automatically changed to that. But always remember, if you did measure something, if you did measure the RECD, say with insert headphones, and it turned out to be different from the average RECD, it's going to slightly change the thresholds, which in turn will change the targets. All right. I think we've beaten that dead horse, okay? Moving all the way through here, la di da di da We did all of that last week. Just want to make sure we've got everything done. Well, here's a picture, too. You know. <clears throat> Coupler response, real ear response. The difference would be real ear to coupler difference. The average RECD, about 10 dB above 1,000 hertz, about 5 dB below 1,000 hertz. In this case, they measured it. So you've got the measured RECD. And the measured RECD in this case was a little bit different from the average. So that's going to slightly change the thresholds, which will in turn change the targets. Okay, we've basically covered, and there's your RECD that I drew, and all the rest of the pack of lies that I've been talking about today. Okay. Look at that. We've done our hour. It's been a rather harried, crazy session this time, but that's okay. We're all right. Next week, we will delve into our next unit. Okay, it will be a different unit. It's no longer today's real ear. In fact, if I take a look, see at it, what is it going to be? It's going to be um, notes for software talks, real ear measurement walks. So we're going to look at Unit 7. We'll look at Unit 7 next week, and the week after, we're going to look at this article by Sanders. That's an interesting, and then that will be the way we finish the course.
So we've got a couple of weeks left hanging on here, but we are moving on toward the end of the semester. <sighs> I'll stop sharing here, and I'll stop recording here. I notice I've lost my two attendees. They probably got pretty pissed off. I mean, anyway, see you when I look at you. Live long and prosper.